Today we're talking about Syria, a country whose map looks like a work of modern art. The conflict is actually more of a military turducken than most conflicts we talk about because this time there's an actual turkey involved. I mean the UN could just save everybody some gas and start holding general assembly meetings in Aleppo. Today I want to talk about the major players in this new conflict and give some context to a peace agreement that was just agreed to. So who are the major players today? Well first, speaking of saving gas, you have America protecting the oil in Syria. Because apparently Trump's newest military advisor is a New Yorker cartoon from 2003. Then you have the primary point of concern today, the remnants of the Syrian civil war. Despite cameo appearances from ISIS in Kurdistan, the primary motif of this conflict has been fighting between the Assad government and the rebels. The Assad government has taken back all of the country that's not Kurdistan, also known as Rojava, US military bases, occupying Turkish forces, rebels making their last stand in Idlib, and Israel. But that last one's been a thing since the 60s, so opposite of breaking news there. The main thing that changed since the last time it covered Syria is the conflict between Turkey and the Syrian government happening in Idlib. Turkey and Syria appear to be on the brink of a major military conflict as tensions escalate in the war-torn country. At least 33 Turkish troops were killed in a Syrian airstrike yesterday. It's the latest escalation of violence that we're seeing in the Idlib region near the Turkish-Syria border. That's right, Turkey is entering the Syrian civil war. Because they were tired of being the one country not at the party, it was at their neighbor's house. Their entrance is pitting them against the Syrian army. And brace yourself for this one, that means fighting against Russian proxy forces in the region. Oh boy is this a mess. But it can be boiled down into three primary groups. Team Syria Russia, Turkey, and the rebel fighters. First let's talk about this new entrant, Turkey, because emotions are already running hot in the country over their entry into this new war. Their parliament literally had a partisan brawl with punches on the floor of their recent escalated intervention into the region. Not great. Although a pay per view brawl between Lindsey Graham and Adam Schiff might be a one time fix for this nation's deficit. So what's motivating Turkey to escalate their entry into this war? Turkey says it's launched a renewed military operation in northwestern Syria. It follows the killing of 34 Turkish soldiers in Syrian government airstrikes in Idlib province on Thursday. Turkey's defense minister says the operation is in self-defense against the Assad regime. Turkey is invading this country for self-defense purposes. What's the logic here? Well, Turkey has long supported opposition forces in Syria's nine years civil war against the president Bashar al-Assad. Unfortunately for Turkey, oh look who's moving in next door, the guy we've been actively rooting against from the beginning. We're going to need to build quite the barrier between our properties. Mr. Erdogan has called for the Syrian government and Russian forces to cease their offensive in Idlib and to pull back from Turkish positions, which have been encircled and cut off by Syrian forces. He also called for a Turkish controlled safe zone in the region for the displaced civilians. Basically what he wants is Syria, why don't you take a deep breath, stop attacking Idlib, and let us share it as a buffer zone where refugees can live and where we can be sure you can't attack us through. Erdogan is putting his money where his mouth is also. Turkey has deployed thousands of troops into the province to stem the Syrian government advance. Now, Turkey's motivations here are not just based on the sitcom strategy of splitting a room in half with tape, claiming half, and then saying, alright, just don't cross, this is my half of the apartment now. They're also looking for a place to put this huge influx of Syrian refugees. Turkey is the world's largest host of refugees, about 4 million, and faces another influx from Syria where the government, backed by Russian air power, is pressing a violent offensive to retake the last rebel held province of Idlib. Now we've recently seen this refugee issue spread over to Europe. 
spokesperson of uh, President Erdogan's ruling AKP said yesterday that Turkey was no longer able to stop the four million refugees currently residing inside Turkey from trying to reach Europe. And that's basically reiterating a long-standing threat by the president to open the gates to Europe. This might seem like an odd detour to take in this episode, but I'm just taking this scenic route to get to a larger point. He opened up those borders and allowed the refugees to continue their journey to Greece. President Erdogan of Turkey declared on Saturday that he had opened his country's borders for migrants to cross into Europe, saying that Turkey could no longer handle the numbers fleeing the war in Syria. Turns out Europe isn't always the biggest fans of open borders, and Greek police are pulling on their handle as hard as they can to keep that door from swinging open. Now, Most people think that there's more to Turkey's plan to open up their borders than just to release some of the refugee pressure on their country. They think it also has something to do with making Europe feel some of the negative externalities of their inaction in Syria. The border opening came after Turkey suffered heavy losses from Russian or Syrian airstrikes in northwest Turkey on Thursday, and as Turkey seeks American and European support for its Syrian operations. You see, Turkey is really, really trying to get Europe and America to end the fighting in Idlib and turn that region into a refugee buffer zone. Turkey has asked the United States for Patriot missiles to help defend its troops and called for NATO to enforce a no-fly zone to protect the nearly 3 million civilians in Idlib province. Of course, America and Europe are consistently letting those calls go straight to voicemail. Washington and NATO members have so far refused to engage militarily in northwest Syria, out of reluctance to confront Russia, Western officials said. Wow, Western officials! You're really saying the quiet part out loud with that statement. Now we're still trying the strategy here of, don't worry, the pen is mightier than the sword. Turkey has been calling on the EU to share the burden of the refugee crisis and on NATO to deploy Patriot missiles on the border with Syria. But NATO doesn't seem to be willing to provide military support offering for the time being words of sympathy. I call on them to stop their offensive, to respect international law and to back UN efforts for a peaceful solution. Of course, this is where things start to get alarming because, well, Turkey is a special country in the Middle East. Turkey is a NATO ally, prompting fears in the West that an attack on Turkey could require a response by allies in Europe and North America, dramatically escalating Syria's already complex war. Now, If there is one thing most people know about the NATO alliance, it's probably that, well, if a NATO ally gets attacked and files the paperwork properly, all other NATO members have to step in and fight with them. Or we could just not go to war with the Syrian government on behalf of Turkey and ignore the request. But what message would that send to those small Eastern European countries that make Americans get B's instead of A's on geography tests? Things don't seem to be heading in a very invady route though, with the Secretary of Defense Mark Esper saying, there has not been that discussion about re-engaging in the civil war. We think the best path forward is through the UN process that is underway. Yeah, when the Secretary of Defense for America says, don't worry, the UN's got this one, they're going to solve this problem any day now, well, that's when you know you're not getting anything from America. We're going to watch this one from the oil fields and see how this all shakes out. Now This brings us to the other major player in this fight, Team Russia Syria. As Bloomberg, the news source, not the billionaire, presciently reported a month ago, with his decision to make a final push to retake Idlib province, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad is walking a perilous line between risking retaliation from neighboring Turkey and saving his economy and moving closer to restoring his nation's territorial integrity. This fight is a lot more than just planting a Syrian flag on a large pile of rubble. Taking Idlib would once and for all end this Syrian civil war and fulfill Assad's vision to rebuild Idlib as a bridge to reconnect Aleppo 
once the nation's productive engine, to the capital, Damascus, and coastal areas. Aleppo was Syria's largest city before the war, so connecting it to their capital and the ocean would be a much needed boon for their devastated economy. Their assault of Idlib also fell at a pretty perfect time, considering Russia's commitment to provide air cover for pro-Damascus forces and President Donald Trump's withdrawal of US troops from the Syrian theater of operations. Now, this gave Assad a green light to finish what he regards as a key step in physically reuniting the Syrian nation. Russia's air dominance over Turkey and Syria has led to a pretty unbalanced war. And worrying reports like As Syrian and Russian forces attempted to retake land lost to rebels on Thursday, Turkish forces supporting the rebels came under fire. Their bloodiest day in the conflict so far. This is why Erdogan is leaving Western leaders all sorts of voicemails about how NATO should really enforce that no fly zone policy in Syria. Let's keep this civil, all punches above the belt. So now to the last group in Idlib, the rebels. Yeah, the situation is not great for them at this point, and their main goal now is not dying. Unfortunately, Turkey, citing their existing refugee problem, has closed their southern border and Syria isn't welcoming them with open arms. So their options are hope for the establishment of a Turkish safe zone or hope for an unconditional surrender of their leaders. This limbo is leading to a situation that has been described as the worst humanitarian crisis in the Syrian civil war. In an optimistic note, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Russian President Vladimir Putin. The biggest line to come out of that is that a midnight ceasefire, or a ceasefire to come into effect at midnight, has been announced for Idlib province in northern Syria. Yes, in one of the most unintentionally revealing news headlines I've seen in a while, the Syrian civil war was paused because of an agreement between Turkey and Russia. Sorry, Assad, I guess Turkey wanted to speak with your manager. Now, two things came out of this agreement. First, a ceasefire, and second, Turkey got their safe zone. The agreement included joint patrols by Russian and Turkish troops of a seven mile wide corridor along a highway that runs through Idlib eastward from the Mediterranean coast towards the border with Iraq. Of course, Erdogan didn't bowl a perfect Turkey in this negotiation. Alright, that pun was a little bit forced. This negotiation cemented in the gains that Assad had made in Idlib province thus far in his invasion. Unfortunately, this ceasefire was immediately violated. But, and this is a but so big Sir Mix-a-Lot might want to write a song about it, residents and fighters in the region said that the front lines, which have seen heavy airstrikes by Russian and Syrian jets and intense Turkish artillery and drone strikes, were largely quiet after the midnight ceasefire came into effect. It seems to have broadly stemmed the violence, at least in the short term, with some notable asterisks. The question now is how much control does Turkey have over Syrian rebels and Russia have over Syria in furthering this peace agreement? Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, non-partisan comedy news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.